Welcome to the Meditation Podcast. You can find all our episodes on meditationpodcast.org. We're also on Pitch and YouTube. You'll find the links in the podcast description. I've got four other podcasts, the Speaking Podcast, the Learn Polish, the Awakening, and the Crypto. All can be found on bio.link forward slash podcaster. My guest today in beautiful Hawaii, I must add, is an award-winning author of a few books, yoga therapist, and spiritual life coach. Please welcome Jenny Lee. Hi, Roy. So nice to be with you today. And first of all, I thank you for coming on so early because there's a 12-hour difference. Yeah, no worries. So we were just joking. You have preceded my meditation this morning, okay. which not a lot does, but I will get to it just after our, we are, our chat. <laughs> okay, brilliant. So, I mean, I, I just kind of hit the bullet points, but you might just let the listeners know a little bit more about Jenny. Yeah, sure. I've been a, a yoga therapist and um, spiritual coach for almost 24 years now. Um, it's a profession that I have loved and been honored to serve in. I have so many wonderful clients from all over the world who seek to improve their lives through self-inquiry practices like meditation um, and who are looking for those those deeper spiritual practices that really bring us into what I consider to be the, the full balance of being human and divine at the same time. And um, I've written three books, uh, which encompass a lot of the teachings that I, I utilize during my coaching practice. Um, I don't know how much we want to get into the books, but I'll just no, highlight we'll them really quickly. We'll touch so, on them, definitely. Yeah. yeah, True Yoga was my first one, which is an encapsulation of the eight limb practice of yoga, um, with meditation certainly being the the pinnacle of that, that eight point practice. Um and really how to how to utilize all eight limbs within the course of our daily lives. Uh, the second book was Breathing Love, Meditation in Action, uh, which to me, the practice of meditation on the cushion is, is the anchor of my day, my life, and then taking that practice out into my interactions and really living with the consciousness that I'm developing during my sitting practice, living in that consciousness of love, uh, divine love for all beings is what that book was about and the third book spark change um, is a book of 108 questions which um, are self-inquiry questions which I utilize with my coaching clients often and um, I'm a firm believer that the opposite side of the meditation coin is self-inquiry so we need to be doing that inner reflection work to see where where we still need to grow and um, what those growing edges are. And I'm always looking for that growing edge. I, I had a teacher who once said, um, if you're not standing at the edge, you're taking up too much room. And uh, that was a little bit uh, harsh, I guess, in a way, but I, I actually, I actually believe it. And I think that we're all here on a journey of growth. And so um, that's something that I'm always working on. And and reflecting back to my clients and through my books. So yeah, right. looking forward to our conversation today. Yeah, I'm just curious, is there a reason why it's 108? Well, 108 is a sacred number in many traditions, both um, spiritual, scientific, uh, lots of different, lots of different cultures have that number in some way in a sacred form. I, I go into a thorough explanation of 108 in the introduction to that book. So I'll leave it at that as a teaser for people to buy the book. Okay, brilliant. <laughs> so like, I know you do the meditation and the yoga, but I'd love to know your own journey, how you got into everything. Yeah, sure. Um, I started practicing physical yoga in my twenties. And, um, that was great. It really brought me into my body in a new way. I think a lot of people come to the practice of yoga through the physical asanas and, um, that's a great entry point. But at the time I was struggling in a marriage. I also, um, excuse me, <clears throat> I have a bit of a cough. So my voice is a little gravelly this morning. Um, <clears throat> I was also struggling because I had a difficult pregnancy at the time. And so I was, I was starting to look inward for answers to these big challenges that life throws at us. You know, we all have them in one form or another. And so I was looking for philosophies and um, methodologies to handle my grief, my anger, my sadness. And um, in yoga philosophy, I really found 
what I consider to be the most beautiful uh, path of, of practice and of philosophy to, to, to deal with all of life's big challenges. So um, I started studying the Yoga Sutras, the Bhagavad Gita, the, the Upanishads, all of the sacred texts of the yoga path. And um, that got me into ultimately, I mean, I'm kind of skipping years, but into owning a yoga studio, starting my yoga therapy practice, working one-on-one -on -one with clients, sharing this philosophy. And, um, and it's just evolved over the years. Uh, so it, it came as many things do. I think our callings come from our own, our own inner journey. And like they say, the wound becomes the medicine. Um, I really believe that when we are willing to do our own self-healing work, we, we develop the strength and the, often the calling to help others do the same. And so that's, that's what it's been for me. And I know that you do surfing and I used to do that in Ireland. And if you've never been surfing in Ireland, put it on your bucket list because it's fantastic. But I, I've been kind of thinking like fishing and same with surfing is a form of meditation because you cannot think of anything else when you're actually surfing the waves. Well, I'm not sure I'm going to join you for surfing in Ireland because mm. I imagine it's really, really cold. Mm. <laughs> and I am a baby when it comes to the water. I've been spoiled by the warm waters here in Hawaii where I learned to surf. And um, so, yeah, might not see you on the waves in Ireland, but I will echo your statement that it is a form of meditation in many ways. Um, I'm kind of a purist when it comes to meditation in the sense that the, in the yoga tradition, they, they really teach that meditation is closing off all of the external senses and going to an inward space of perception that is difficult to reach. I mean, it's hard to close off our senses, right? That's the practice of Pratyahara, but it's, it's really hard to do. So when we're making a, a comparison, um, to a practice like running or surfing or fishing or whatever as a meditation. Yes, in a, in a way it is. It's a form of, of what I would call focus, um, which is on the eight limb path of yoga, that's dharana. And it is the prelude to the state of meditation, which is that really deep inner stillness where we're just closed off from the external world. But to develop focus, is so essential because we can't go inward to that state of awareness until we can focus on something like the breath, a mantra, um, the third eye point, whatever it is that we're using as that focal technique. So a practice like surfing or fishing really is a beautiful um, form of that initial sort of practice of meditation, right? The practice of concentration or, or single pointed attention, because yeah, if you're not paying a hundred percent attention to the next wave that's coming, I mean, I've done it. I've been thrown over the falls and it's not fun. So, um, and even when you get the wave, like for me, there's just nothing else happening. I can't, I don't think about what's happening in my life or whatever challenges are on my plate. I'm completely immersed in the moment of that joy. And of course, that is what we are hoping to experience in our seated meditation is the complete immersion into the moment where we are experiencing the joy that's within us. Because I really do believe that our innate being is joyful. And so as we, as we tap inward, 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 we find that core of joy. Um, so yeah. <laughs> Brilliant, brilliant. And the qualifications, then you might just kind of delve into what exactly it's uh, you studied on it. I know it's C I A Y T, and then there's E R Y T five hundred yoga certified teachers. So you might just kind of go into the different qualifications that you've studied. Yeah, well, in the United States, um, there's two kind of governing bodies for the yoga world. I mean, governing bodies. I have a little bit of a problem with that because yoga is just. It's always been passed from teacher to student. I don't think there needs to be any kind of qualifying bodies, but um, the IAYT is the International Association of Yoga Therapists, and that's my primary um, certification. It's uh, I, although I had been practicing yoga therapy for many years before 
the organization started certifying people. So I ended up getting grandfathered in and it was a whole thing, but um, they are now qualifying different schools within the States to create curriculum that encompasses both, not just the physical practice, but the philosophical practice of yoga. And also more, more specifically to the therapeutic side of practice. So um, I always liken yoga therapy to uh, that there's a very broad range of yoga therapy. So some people take it from a very physical standpoint, like a physical therapist might. And I certainly have worked with many clients who come in with, with physical conditions that they're needing therapeutic um, asana to help rehabilitate. However, that has not become my specialty. My specialty has become more on the psycho-spiritual realm. Um, so I deal with clients who often are going through periods of transition, grief, loss, um, anxiety, depression, the types of things that they might go to a psychotherapist for, but they come into yoga therapy or the spiritual coaching that I do from um, with a desire to really look at the, the spiritual side of themselves. Maybe it's something that they have never looked at, but they recognize is kind of a component that is missing in that holistic sense of self. And um, and so we look at how to work with the conditions of being human from that spiritual standpoint. And um, that is, I would say within the, within the organization of the International Association of Yoga Therapists, it's not something that most of the yoga therapists work with. I think more and more are starting to recognize that, but um, it's, it's something that I feel very passionate about. Um, because the our our spirituality, I think, is something that we cannot ignore forever, um, and it's and our perception of what that is is very unique. So it's not an application of any religious path or any particular definition of spirituality, but it's really a coaxing from within an individual what their perception of that is. And what have you kind of noticed over the last kind of? two decades you know the, because before there wasn't as many people but now it's opened up which i think is a fantastic thing there's a lot more people embracing this where before it was kind of he was shunned by a lot of churches and religions and everything yeah there's definitely a greater awareness i would say that in the 24 years i've been practicing i've done a tremendous amount of education around what yoga therapy is um, it's not commonly understood like I said, most people experience, at least in the Western world, um, experience yoga usually as the postures. They go to a yoga class and they're doing a certain routine of postures, which are great. But within the eight limb path of yoga, that is a very small fraction of what true yoga actually is. And that's why I titled my first book, True Yoga, because I really wanted to educate people on the fact that the postural practice is such a small element. And it's really meant to prepare the body for the deeper practices of self-reflection, of meditation, of concentration, the things that we've already touched upon. So we can't do that if we have a restless body. Um, so the postural practice is meant to prepare our bodies for seat, seated practice, stillness. And yes, there is a greater awareness building. Uh, so that's great. <laughs> that is great. Brilliant. And because I was looking at the different ones of the yoga that uh, Kundalini, people know, yin, yin uh, restorative, uh, hatha, like you might just talk on the different ones and explain what the different ones are for those that wouldn't be aware of it. Sure. So, um, and people often say like, what type of yoga do you teach or whatever? And I would answer that question by saying I teach Raja yoga. So Raja yoga is the Royal yoga and it really encompasses all of the types of yoga. So the ones you just mentioned, yin, restorative, hatha, um, Kripalu, vinyasa ashtanga you know we can go on and on there's a thousand different physical iterations of of the practice so those are all more in the the realm of asana now that's not to say that that's all that those practices do they bring in some of the philosophy as well but 
there are forms of practice. So bodily forms um, that focus on different, different aspects of the physical. Raja yoga encompasses as well the practice of service. So seva, karma yoga, um, jnana. Jnana is the wisdom path. So it's the study of the philosophy. Um, and bhakti yoga, the devotional practice, like my second book, Breathing Love, Meditation in Action. It's really bringing that love into all that we do. So the devotional love, not it's recognizing spirit or the divine in all beings, um, not just in a singular partner that you might be in romantic relationship with. So the, that bhakti practice of devotion. Uh, that's the that's underneath the umbrella of Raja Yoga or the Royal Path, and that's that is what I teach. So it's bringing in elements from all these different aspects. Brilliant, and I know that uh, you can. I think I believe you studied journalism, but you've done a lot of writing for a lot of uh, magazines as well. And there was one. It was about um, I have it written down there. It's about uh, some cancer uh, care. The, the cancer care uh, continuum 2009 you might just tell me about that but also the other articles that you're writing the different uh, things that you're being writing for oh gosh well i've written lots of articles for many different online um, blogs and things the book that you mentioned i was a contributor to several books recently in the yoga therapy um, realm the cancer care continuum um was I I contributed a chapter on the end of life. So the practice of yoga therapy at the end of life, particularly within um, the realm of cancer care. So I've had several clients who have passed from cancer. And as you and I were speaking of, often that is a long process for someone as their body is winding down um, because of that disease. And so but it really doesn't matter what what disease a body passes from. The end of life is just a particularly rich time for people to come into a deeper awareness of self, right? So we're very body identified most of the time. It's natural as human beings. We have these bodies. We operate through these bodies. We think these bodies are who we are. And we identify as them, um, as our physical characteristics and capacities. And then, but when we get towards the end of life and these bodies are no longer functioning as they once did, um, and we know that their end is imminent, we start to question who we actually are. You know, that identity of the physical is falling away. And when there is a lengthy process of, um, before death, it is a, as I said, it's a very rich time for this self inquiry. And so I've been blessed to work with, with many clients who um, have been dying of cancer. And we've had this time period in which they have ex been able to experience through practices that I've helped them with, like, like meditation and self inquiry, where they, they tap into a different understanding of who they are. And to help someone pass with that awareness of you know that they are an eternal being that the consciousness that is within the body is not determinant of the body so it's not going to go with the body the consciousness goes on and our we are eternal beings and so to know that brings great peace near the end of life for people and I've I've just witnessed that piece come in. I've witnessed it with my mom. I've witnessed it with many clients where when the identification of self shifts from the physical vessel to the inner self, it's it's a whole different level of being, a level of awareness. Very beautiful. It, it, exactly. It must be beautiful also to kind of witness somebody because some people have a fear of that. And, Most people. Yeah, I mean, like, because basically what, what happened is w with us that w I had to delay because my father passed unexpectedly on the 18th. And I just see different people, how they actually 
uh, see that. But he did not have a fear of debt. You know, he had, you know, he bought, he wasn't a fear of debt. My mother doesn't, I don't, you know, but I know that a lot of people do. But just for you, when you're actually, you know, working with people to actually get them from the state of a fear to just ex accepting it and feeling, oh, I'm looking forward to the next journey must be fantastic. It's fantastic. It really is. And the yoga sutras talk about this fear of death. It's called the Vinavesa in the Sanskrit. And um, it's a natural human fear, like I said, because once we embody, we are identified as the body. So it's natural, even for those of us like you and I, I would say I'm not afraid of death either, but I'm a healthy functioning you know, individual right now. It's natural at near the time of death when when the um, consciousness knows that it's about to release the body for fear to come in. It's just pretty documented that even the the enlightened masters have a moment where the there's like an attachment, there's a holding on to the body. Now, that doesn't mean that that fear has to stay. It could be very momentary and, and then hopefully go to that next phase of peace. And that's what I've witnessed. So I've witnessed a, a great identification with the body. Like I can't possibly leave this thing to, okay, yes, I understand I'm more than that, but then getting very close to the threshold, a, another clinging fear state come in. And then beyond that, a full acceptance, release, surrender, peace, and joy. What's amazing is the, the moments of joy. And it's interesting because that is perceptible. For me, it's perceptible at a very intuitive level when I've been sitting with people who are right at that threshold of death. It's not, they are not necessarily able to communicate. My mom is a great example. Um, she, this was when she was right at the end of her ability to communicate. She, her eyes were closed. I talk about this in, in one of my books. Um, and she just barely whispered, I can see now. And it's so beautiful. And she couldn't see, her eyes were closed. She had not been in the outer world for a long time, but she was seeing something internally. And there was this incredible joy and peace that came in for her. Um, so I just know that death is not something to fear. And if I can be with people, I've worked hospice as well. And that's also such a beautiful, um, a beautiful honor and service to, um, to help people get to that place of peace it's really 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 special mm -hmm. beautiful and because you mentioned earlier kind of helping people as well dealing with that and i've noticed it because you know obviously i mean my grandmother and lots of uncles and stuff passed it through different cancers and different things but this was kind of an unexpected one and i've seen people kind of react differently to the one so not just for um family of mine but for people dealing with Grief. I mean, I, I know that when there's a terminal illness, you kind of, it's expected. It doesn't mean it's easy. But when it's a kind of, you know, one minute you're talking to the person, you're expecting to talk to them again later. And, and it just ends. How for people like that, how what's the best way that you can kind of deal with that? Or is it each individual? And you have to just try to find how to navigate into their kind of head to to see how to help them best. Yeah, there's not really one answer. It does definitely depend on the individual, but I think just speaking about it, I mean, we in the Western world don't talk about death like you and I are doing today very often. I mean, it's kind of a taboo topic. It's not like indigenous cultures where death is a part of daily life and they have the the individual who has passed in their homes and they, you know, they're grieving and um, touching the body and kind of interacting with death at a much more visceral level. And they're just there. There's a recognition, like you said, that this is a part of, of the life process. It's, and we have, I think in the Western world really shunned that and put it away from our, our daily thought and like how we sequester elderly people into homes and what, there's not the intermix of generations in our in our homes like there has been in the past in in many cultures and 
So we're just not as in touch with it. So it's a, it's sort of a feared topic. And um, so I think the first thing is just really talking about it, um, talking about the transitory temporary nature of life itself. And the more we can come into acceptance of our own mortality, that this is, uh, this is just a, a part-time thing and <laughs> it's not a forever thing. Um, but, but, but in, a, in addition to the acceptance of that, I think what brings comfort is the recognition that we are more than this. So I think if someone doesn't have that understanding of themselves, and this is where it gets into the work that I do, is helping people to have that understanding of their spiritual self, the, the consciousness that's within the body. Once you know that aspect of self, then you don't fear the release of the physical body as much. Not to say that there might be a moment, but it, it's just not as overwhelming. Excellent. And my youngest child, he's nine. And I didn't bring him to Ireland, but when it happened, I explained everything to him. And my, the body was actually laid out in the front room on the couch. And he looked so peaceful and beautiful. And my mother's sense of humor, she said, I know he's dead because he's not snoring, you know, so that's, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, and like she, she embraced it in such a way. She hasn't cried, but they were so close. They went on holidays. They went to my brother, to me, and they just came back from a holiday. We all had a video of him singing two days earlier, but she said he died in her arms. She told him she loved, she said he just went like that. And she said, she thinks that that's why she feels so good because she knows that she didn't feel pain. But with my son, I told him, look, he's laid out. Do you want to see him? Because, and he did, and he saw him. And and then when I came back, I was talking about everything, explaining everything to him. And he was listening deeply, you know? And I, I think, beautiful. yeah, I think it's just to, to have the open conversation. But on another side, then when I was kind of, I was trying to help my mother do everything. And I with the clothes because I know that's a hard one for some people for me it was like it's something that has to be done but I know my brother he got emotional when he saw that because that was like when you're removing the clothes as well I know everybody's there's something that will trigger them and I thought I didn't want my mother to be doing that because obviously I cleared it with her first that she was happy with what I was doing but I thought she'll have an emotion perhaps with each bit of clothing that she sees and then that might try, trigger sadness when there's not family and friends around her. And But we all yeah, kind of different things. It, I mean, sadness is not something to be feared either. And I think people really try to keep those heavier emotions like sadness or anger out <laughs> they, they, or, they, or down. They suppress them. And um, I do a lot of emotional process work with people as well because sadness is not something to fear. We are meant to cry. We are meant to emote. I mean, again, going back to indigenous cultures, they wail. There is a there is a release of that sadness through the voice, through the tears, through the talking. And we're meant to do that. It's built into us. And it's it is how we metabolize the loss of the, the physical individual. Now, if we have an awareness, like it sounds like your mom does, that, that that individual is not totally gone from her. He's still with her in spirit, in his love, in the, all the memories that they shared, in the energy that, that she feels him, his consciousness is still with her. And so she's probably going to move through periods of ability to be silly humorous and, and light which is wonderful because what a wonderful way to honor his life you know with that lightness and we want to have joy as well as the ability to cry and and feel sadness but why do we feel sadness we feel sadness because we have an attachment and this is another um, aspect in yoga philosophy that raja and devesa so attachment and aversion these dual states that we move through as human beings where we have we want one thing, we don't want another. So we're attached or we're pushing away. And attachment is not the same as love. So her love, I mean, I don't know your mother and God bless her. I'm sorry, we're using her as an example here in this moment, but this is true for anyone. Like if we're attached to someone, then we suffer when they're gone. But that is very different than love. 
if we stay in the state of love for that individual, then when they're gone, nothing's changed. We're still loving them and they're still loving us, hopefully. And so um, when, when I have lost, and I've lost many individuals in my life, um, but when I've lost someone super close, like my mom, and I think of her, you know, and I might tear up because I was very close to my mom. Um, when, when she comes strongly into my heart, and I'm sad, the sadness comes in because she's not here. Well, that's just because I'm attached. I, you know, I wanted something from her. But if I can shift that state of mind from the attachment to the love, then I feel joy again. So I go from sadness to joy. So it's really about how we're holding um, our own state of consciousness. And, and so Sadness is not something to be feared. It's something that we are meant to move through, but it's also not a place that we are meant to stay forever. Like the, I think people think they're going to dive into a pit and never get out. Well, you will get out if you shift to true love rather than attachment. Beautiful, beautiful. And just kind of on pictures, because I know that when I go home, like my mother has pictures all over the house and it's beautiful to see and just all family members, those have passed and those are still present. But I don't. And I know that my grandmother died. I was lucky that, you know, she lived till 96. So, you know, I was in my 40s when she actually passed. But I had the picture and then I was looking at it and it was kind of making me sad. And I was like, I, I, I put that away. And, but with my dad, we had a picture of him just smiling. It wasn't just typical because he, he kind of didn't. He wasn't really photogenic when he took when we took a picture of him. He was never smiling, but we got fantastic pictures and we we use that. And now when I look at that, it brings me so much joy. And I think, you know, I have made a transition as well, just thinking of things differently by just looking at the, just having a picture around. Now I, I want to have my grandmother there as well, just to remember the beautiful things, just like what you were saying previously. Right, right. That's beautiful. That's really beautiful. So like, I, I know you do retreats as well. So you might tell me a little bit about the kind of retreats that you're doing. Yeah, sure. Uh, once a year, I do a, a retreat that has yoga and meditation each day. We go to a beautiful place. So there's always um, interaction with the place. Uh, I've done many over the many years that I've done them in different parts of the world. But this September, the, I'm doing one in Tuscany, Italy, um, in a part of Tuscany that's very special to me. I have many friends there and local connections. I've spent a lot of time there. I speak Italian. Um, I think my heart and soul actually lives in Italy, but um, so yeah, I still have a couple spaces on that one. If anybody wants to come, it's in September. Um, we do yoga and meditation every morning and evening. I teach um, spiritual topics like the things we're talking about today. And our theme for that one is dare to live. So uh, it's going to be a really fun one and lots of wine tasting and farm tours and thermal hot springs and all kinds of fun things Beautiful. in the Tuscan countryside. So there's that. Um, I'm also starting a brand new program, which will also be happening in Italy in the fall of 2024. And it's a slightly different type of, of retreat program. It's actually a writers and artists residency for two weeks in the Tuscan countryside at a beautiful private hamlet, um, medieval hamlet uh, that I've rented. And so and that one is is going to be slightly different in the sense that it's more focused on having um, creative folks there doing their personal work and sharing some of their their work with the community um, that will be formed. And so it's a new way of expanding my reach in the world and um, celebrating other voices of creativity. I've done a lot of self-promotion of my own books and it gets a bit tiring after a while. So I'm really looking forward to lifting up some other creative uh, expressions through song or art or books. So I encourage people to apply. It's called the SNA Residency and I'll give you the link to share. Okay, perfect. And I know you've got, I think, I believe two online courses, which are very reasonably priced. You may just tell me about the two of them. Yeah, sure. Those are our older offerings that have been on my website for a while, but still timeless. I think one is a um, developing a sustainable meditation practice. And the reason I titled it that is because many people start meditation, they get discouraged if they don't really get quick results. And 
meditation is a long-term game. So it's, it's kind of, for me, the elements that are required for creating sustainability over time, not getting discouraged. What do you really need? Um, that one's on there. And then I have another one that's an introduction to yoga therapy, which gives, um, I think it's a seven or eight part series that goes through the different eight limb practices and um, also gives very practical um, daily kind of tools to use both self-reflection questions, physical practices, breath work. So there's a little bit of everything in the yoga therapy course. Right. And with the, the three books, then are you have you published or, or do you actually self publish? The, the, no, the I was traditionally published. So my first two were by Llewellyn Worldwide. And my third book, Spark Change, was by uh, Sounds True, which is a wonderful publisher here in the States of um, self help and spirituality titles. So um, yeah, it was always important to me to be traditionally published. Uh, I wanted that validation of a a, a major publishing house saying, yes, you're worthy of <laughs> us publishing your work. So that was, that was gratifying. And um, I'm grateful to have gone through that process. I have another, another book that's circulating right now. So we'll hope for another contract, but if, if it doesn't get it, I will self publish that one. So we'll see how that goes. And you've, <laughs> uh, you've got an award for your books as well, I believe. Yes. Yeah, lots of different awards actually on the different books, but the the biggest known one is the Nautilus Book Award. Well, I'm the last book, Spark Change. So the Nautilus Book Award is a fairly prestigious one in the states, and um, was grateful to receive that. So uh, Spark Change, 108 provocative questions for spiritual evolution. I love that uh, it's that subtitle that they gave it. It's, it encompasses what that book is all about. And um, it's a great book for people who even aren't into yoga or meditation, because um, I've had people who don't write, don't practice those things right now, um, say that they've picked up that book and found lots of things that are interesting to reflect upon. And it's been utilized in universities and in church groups and um, book clubs. And it's very accessible. It's not a cover to cover read. It's more like dip in, grab a question, think about it, talk about it with your friends. Like it's, um, it's a fun and different kind of book. And I think people tend to read them more because I'm kind of shocked at the amount of people that actually read. I read a lot of books. I read about 100 books a year. But there's a lot of people, once they leave university or whatever, they'll never read again. And I think the way that you structure the book encourages people because they'll always say, ah, I can spare 10 minutes and read a bit. And before they know it, they've, they've actually finished the book. Yeah. Yeah, I think we're, unfortunately, we are losing our ability to concentrate in our technological world of sound bites and quick hits on Instagram and YouTube and everything else. But um, it, the ability to sit and read is another way of practicing focus or concentration. And I actually even found for myself, I've always been a huge reader, but I even found that my ability to stay with my reading for say even half an hour was starting to diminish. And I thought, oh my gosh, I'm actually being affected by the, the quick bits of information that we're all supposed to absorb. And I need to not allow this to happen. So now if I sit down to read, I make it a point to sit and read one thing for a period of time, whatever period of time I might have that day, but I will set it aside ahead of time. I'll say, I'm sitting here for 15 minutes or I'm sitting here for 30 minutes and I won't let myself pick up the phone or you know get distracted because I wanna keep that ability to focus. Um, it's a very important capacity for human beings for many different reasons. Um, to create anything, we have to focus. To meditate, we have to focus. So it's it's essential. To sir, we have to focus. <laughs> Definitely. And I suppose just fine. You might just give a, of the 108, you might just kind of give us one of the things that you discussed, just to give them, you know, because I, I looked at the, on all your three books, I've looked at all the reviews. You've got fantastic reviews on all three books. So, you know, <laughs> obviously, you know, they, they love your work, all the different people that have purchased the book. Thank you. Yeah, people do love my books. I wish more people knew about them. Does, uh, but the people who know about them do love them. So I just picked up the book off my shelf. I'm just going to open it to a page. Let's see what which question I came to. Um, well, okay, this one's an easy one. What gives my life the most meaning? 
what gives my life the most meaning? You know, we spend a lot of time. There's So each question is followed by a, a descriptive paragraph, and I won't read the whole thing, but I'll give my off-the-cuff summary of that. So our lives are busy. We spend a lot of time on a lot of things, but a lot of it is not really that important. And it's probably not what we would answer that question with, what gives my life the most meaning. So if you look at the course of your day and you chunk it out, how much time you've given to this, this, or this, but your meaning is over here and you haven't given any time to it, then that's a, an equation that is askew. So I think to ask a question like that of yourself and then look at how you're dividing your time pi, it brings it into clear focus pretty quickly. How, how are you utilizing your life energy? And the, the control or the management of our life energy, this is a yogic practice. This is pranayama. So how we are interchanging life energy every day in all the different relationships, conversations, um, activities is important because we don't want to drop dead tomorrow and then be on the other side going, oh man, I really squandered that lifetime. I utilize my life energy in terribly unmeaningful ways. So, so it's questions like that throughout the book. And the book is set up in 12 um, parts, 12 themes. So I'm not sure which theme that was in, but things like beliefs, um, inspiration, uh, accountability, and so you could even take a theme that, that it attracts you and look at the nine questions that are within that theme. So beautiful. And I mean, I think just on what you just mentioned, I mean, I, I make sure I do everything I love. I mean, I'm outside. I love the sun. I don't like lying down. I like reading a book. So I'm outside. I have all my meals outside when, you know, when the weather is nice. And also it's the people I surround myself with that, if I see that they're sucking my energy, I limit it or I just cut the ties. And then you, I know a new bridge, you break a bridge, a new one forms. And it's something that I was saying to my mother, because I know some people, they, 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 you know, they just come in and they're sucking the energy. And I said, you look after yourself. Don't let people take your energy, you know, be firm in what you're doing. And I think sometimes we try to tiptoe around life to, you know, I don't want to rock the boat, right? But at the end of the day, you never regret that when you actually kind of serve yourself first, because you can serve other people better when you're serving yourself, when you're in your full self, that your energy is up because you're surrounding yourself with people. They come to your house, you feel 10 times better as opposed to, you know, <laughs> just gets sucked out of your body. And same with the different things that you do. By doing that, you just become like a magnet to the, the people that you want to be with. Yeah. Yeah, it is really important to to look at, again, how we're giving our energy, how we're exchanging it with the people around us or the activities. Um, and I, I understand what you're saying about serving yourself first. And I, that's not in like a narcissistic way, but it's really serving that highest self, the, the, the part of yourself that is most aligned. Um, like you were mentioning being out in the sunshine, being in nature, it feeds your spirit in a way that enables you to be your best self. And so then when you come to your relationships, you're there in your greatest aligned and best self. And so, yeah, to that degree, yes, we do need to take care, self care in order to show up to life and to the things that are meaningful to us in our, in our healthiest way. Absolutely. And what, what I would actually encourage you to do is go to Ireland, but wear a bodysuit because that's something that I do. But even with the cold, that brings a different form of energy as well. And I always came away from surfing in Ireland full of energy. It never took my energy away, even when it was freezing. So I'd encourage you to try it once and you, you will <laughs> enjoy it. I, I should do that. Yes, I will embrace the cold uh, because I know it can be very invigorating. I'm going to go to the Pacific Ocean in California and I'll 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 make my way towards Ireland. <laughs> my son is in California and we're going to surf in August. I choose the warmest month in the Pacific Ocean to get in, but it's still cold for me. So then I wear a full wetsuit. <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. Listen, Jenny, thoroughly enjoyed our conversation. You might let people know how they can get in contact with you. 
Oh, thanks, Roy. I enjoyed our conversation as well. It's nice to have the spontaneity that you bring to your podcast. Um, uh, people can get in touch with me primarily through my website, Jenny Lee yoga therapy.com. Um, Jenny is spelled J E N N I E Lee yoga therapy.com. You can find all of my books and services and courses and retreat information, everything there. Um, I will also provide you with the, the link for SRA residency, which is the writers and artists program, um, next year in Tuscany. Uh, and my books are on Amazon, um, uh, both in audio form and physical form. So I look forward to hearing from anyone who's heard this podcast and has any questions or would like to work together. Yeah, perfect. Thank you very much, Jenny. Thank you. So that's all for the meditation podcast. You'll find all our episodes on meditationpodcast.org. Find us on BitChute and YouTube and my coaching along with my other podcast, bio.link forward slash podcaster. Be sure to give us a thumbs up, five star rating, and share with your friends. And when you get Jenny's book, make sure you give her a five star rating as well and share with your friends because it helps to get more people to listen. Until next week, take care.